Sorry about that, everyone. No what? worries. I am, I'm glad you got it figured out because I'm moderating later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Recording in progress. Yes, it turned out that it had yesterday's link where my Zoom link was supposed to be, and so I couldn't get in. However, uh, greetings and welcome to the bins and bags and boxes resource sharing infrastructure and its challenges. I am Carol Witt from CW Mars, the moderator for this session. A few housekeeping notes. Please note that this session is being recorded. And I will be adding a link to the captioning in the chat momentarily. And I will be monitoring the chat for questions and comments. I would like to thank all of our sponsors, including those at the champion level, Equinox for sponsoring the platform, ECDI for sponsoring the captions, and Kipu for sponsoring Hackfest. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have a number of them today. Katie Greenleaf Martin of Pales, Ruth Fraser Davis of Evergreen, Indiana, uh, Stephen V. Potter of Missouri Evergreen, Joe Newvin of Wilmington Public Library, and Galen Charlton of Equinox Open Library Initiative. And uh, who will be going first? <laughs> Uh, I will go ahead and kick us off if that's all right with uh, everybody. And um, thank you so much, Carol, for welcoming us. Uh, Galen is going to do the slides, and then um, I will sort of um, moderate the discussion ports of, of this presentation. I think um, we're going to try to stay on schedule, but also have a relatively loose outline today. So feel free to join in the discussion on any of the available chats and we'll try to keep an eye on all of those. Um, as I mentioned, or as Carol mentioned, I'm Katie Greenleaf Martin from the Evergreen Consortium in Pennsylvania. We're called Spark and my organization is called Pales. And Ruth, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit? I would not mind. I, it seems like my my connection is a little bit unstable, so I've turned my camera off and I'm trying to close a bunch of things. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, so if I'm breaking in and out, congratulations. But if I'm not, I'm the coordinator for the Evergreen Indiana Library Consortium and I, as well as the Evergreen Community Development Initiative. Um, and where I'm at is in the name. Joe. Did I miss something else I was supposed to say? That was perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. It's you, Joe. Sorry. Oh, sorry, guys. I'm Joe Kenevan. I'm the director of the Wilmington Public Library, a member of the Consortium of Ohio Libraries. And as Ruth said with hers, where I am is in the name. Put the two together, you get exactly where we are. <laughs> it's good to be here. And Galen. Good morning, everybody. Where I am is not uh, the Ed Um There's uh, no town of uh, Equinox, uh, Georgia, to my knowledge. Um, but I'm uh, the IT manager at uh, Equinox um, and uh, an Evergreen uh, committer um, and responsible, uh, at least uh, in part, uh, for some of uh, the deep uh, complexity of hold and courier uh, and transit management uh, that Evergreen offers. And we're going to talk a lot about why that is a wonderful thing. So the first thing that we want to do is uh, talk about what we're doing today. Um, uh, and I will have a just kind of cover this a little bit and then I'll let my compatriots fill in any uh, blanks that I leave out. But uh, to define our terms a little bit, we are talking about resource sharing and what we're you what we're using that term for is to talk about uh, interlibrary loan so items moving between libraries affiliated or otherwise uh, that the patrons themselves typically get to do and sometimes it can be staff mediated but it happens only through the ILS it's not going out to another client 
like a statewide ILL. We'll talk a little bit about some of the statewide ILL situations and how they interact with the courier stuff going on. Um, but we're talking here about holds placed in Evergreen uh, where an item is targeted that needs to be moved around and then all the mechanics of the what gets targeted and how does it move around. We'll also be talking about the fantastically complex ways in which consortia do this um, and uh, how those arrangements have evolved and then how it all works in Evergreen now, how we're learning to make it work in Evergreen better and what the future may look like. And I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in real quick because I do that. I'm interrupting chicken. But um, also I think that it's very important to take a moment and really think about what the terminology is in your consortium or your library or your organization because this really does vary a lot. Um, we had this conversation, how do we, we actually talk about this? Um, in Indiana, resource sharing is actually the big umbrella. And, and below that, um, we have the ideas of interlibrary loan. We, we, then we talk about evergreen transits. And for us, evergreen transits equals resource sharing in this presentation. So just think about what, how that may be talked about in your organization, because the name might be a little bit different. Uh, and we want this to be as meaningful as possible for you. So the first thing we're going to do is just kind of give the status quo for each of the three of us who are in consortia. And Ruth is up first. Yeah, so, and, and I will say too, uh, and I think that I might speak for all of the panelists here. Um, we have recently had things happen that had to do with resource sharing it. And like, I feel things when I start talking about it. And so I need to like put my feelings aside and say, this is the way, the reality of the thing. So in Evergreen, Indiana, we have a statewide career program that is managed by the Indiana State Library. Um, and when I say manage, that means that they handle like getting subscribers, uh, and they have staff in place to troubleshoot issues, things like that. But we also then use contracts with third party logistics company or companies uh, to actually move the things around. Um, one of the things that um, I have taken for granted because of course I'm in the bubble of Indiana, which sounds very fraught, but nonetheless um, is that participation um, in some type of resource sharing uh, structure in Indiana is required for public libraries to meet standards. Um, and in order to be a member of Evergreen Indiana Library Consortium, that there is a requirement to have a membership with Info Express, because the idea is we are a resource sharing consortium and this is the way that resource sharing happens in the most efficient way, mostly speaking. Um, and so there's that requirement. I'm gonna pass it off to Katie. Ruth teed me up very nicely here because one of the distinctive things about our consortium in Pennsylvania is that there are zero requirements for participation. Um, in various types of resource sharing uh, arrangements. Uh, we have uh, county library systems in Pennsylvania that do not share stuff with each other. Um, there, is a, um, there is a very robust statewide interlibrary loan system that uses a different third-party client um, and uh, it depends on who you ask about whether or not um, 
participation is required for public libraries, but it is not a requirement that's currently being enforced, shall we say. Uh, so we have a hodgepodge of um, various things throughout the state. Our consortium, yep, that's what we, Pennsylvania is the land of special snowflakes. Every community is a special snowflake. And um, so we, in our consortium, we do coalitions of the willing. So if you want to share stuff with other libraries, if you want to be in a group with a resource sharing group uh, with the other counties in your library district, um, and also a, a, a sharing group of neighboring counties that doesn't also share with the other libraries in your district, we are fine with that. Uh, and we have worked with our hosting vendor Equinox extensively to create a fascinating spider web of policies uh, and now hold proximities, which we'll talk about in a little bit to support that. So we have locations that do not um, allow, we, I, we still, I believe, have at least one public library location in Spark that does not allow its patrons to place holds on its own items for pickup at that library. Um, and then we have lots of locations that don't uh, share with anybody else. Yes, it's a uh, it's a mixed multitude. <laughs> when you're when your own when your own cobra like, what? Um, and so you know we we went from um, in 2016 uh, when I came to Pennsylvania there was uh, no, the Spark Consortium had no cross county resource sharing. We now have resource sharing groups with um, approaching a million and a half items. So we've made a lot of change uh, over the time uh, that I have been here and we're gonna continue mm -hmm. chipping away at it. Oh, and uh, deliveries all over the place, everything from vans to UPS to, uh, we don't have any ponies, but we got everything else. Yeah. Definitely, Galen. We can definitely, we can do that. Don't you have like a courier uh, service? That's there is a, a state. Ponies? We have a, we do have, yes, there is a library system, not a Spark library system. There is a library system that has a van system called the Pony. Uh, and we do have a uh, non a separate nonprofit that runs a, a UPS shipping consortium. Um, most of our libraries don't use that for like internal system deliveries and district deliveries. They do use it for uh, cross cross district and cross county things often. And we're going to talk about what we maximize for later on in this presentation and how that's impacted by some of those different structures. And Joe. Right. I was going to say, and then in our the consortium we're in in Ohio, we share, as part of our principles of cooperation, we share nearly all circulating items. The only exceptions we wrote into that was realia, and we do allow age hold protections, though we've increasingly discouraged their use um, on most items for a variety of reasons that we don't need to go into here. Delivery, it's going to sound a lot like Indiana, except for cool, it's on a much smaller scale. Delivery is typically handled by a third-party logistics company that the state library contracts with for all consortia in Ohio, which the I was counting them this morning. There's at least 10 different consortia across the state. Um, some are statewide, some are highly localized. And then in cool, because we are small enough and we all talk to each other and know each other reasonably well, there have been some times over the years, especially more recently, where we've actually had staff delivering material in their personal vehicles um, from place to place a little bit, which was never planned, but it worked remarkably well for what it was for the circumstances. And while I don't have access to see them as well, I really feel some of the frustrations that Ruth was talking about with how life has gone in the logistics business in the last several years. And I think we're ready to move to the next slide, maybe. So uh, we're going to continue our conversation about what are some of the logistical details <laughs> and exactly um, what happens. And 
um maybe we'll have I, I wonder if it would be good to have joe to start because you have kind of like the most centralized uh well maybe indiana who who wants to pontificate? It's us. we do <laughs> so um this is kind of one of those things where we just kind of threw a bunch of ideas in here uh things that go into this but this is not at all um this is not comprehensive at all, but things that uh, play into the whole thing um, having to do with, we are using third party providers in a lot of cases, but not all cases. Um, and where we have policies in our organizations and um, we are either functioning from the standpoint of some tax funded, uh, thing or uh, a 501c3 or some kind of little uh, amalgamation of the two because um, of course we're libraries and everything has got to be kind of weird. Um, we get into at least for us in, in Indiana uh, because our courier program uh, is managed by the state library we're also subject to the Indiana state government procurement policies um, which is yet another special uh, thing that has to happen. Um, but often, and, and I think um, Katie, uh, you definitely have to do this. Joe, you're, you're in, a, in a weird situation where it's kind of procurement, but then also maybe RFP and RFP is a little bit mm, all over here. Uh, but then also, <laughs> that's I would say it's procurement, but it's procurement that I blessedly don't have visibility to. There's a Department mm -hmm. of Administrative Services that tells me what the contract is after they've negotiated it. So, And you just hope that it all works out okay. But we have yeah. seen it doesn't always work out okay. Uh, but then also, how does this integrate if it integrates um, with the ILS? Um, who is doing uh, the management of all of these packages? Where is it being sorted? How is it be the, the sorting locations? How are they being optimized? I know Galen's going to talk about that, especially in terms of um, Spark. And then understanding what, because we know what the library workflows are, and we know how to get the things out the door and bring them into the door, but we don't always necessarily know what happens to them when they go out the door and before they come back in the door. Uh, and we, we found in Indiana through our trials and tribulations, all of those details um, and, and realized that it was important to actually, it would have helped us if we had understood those details better um, even prior to the the year of our discontent. Anyway, okay, moving on. What have I missed in here? So I will jump in um, with um, the way that the details of what the courier uh, does uh, can matter. Um, yeah, there's of course, you know, if a courier uses a hub and spoke uh, model and you know, materials have to travel between hubs uh, to make other way back um, to a library that can affect uh, things. But it can also matter what the courier does uh, besides ship library books around. Um, as another Evergreen Consortium discovered uh, in the beginning of the pandemic because their courier moved books, their courier also has a significant business uh, in moving pharmaceutical and medical test uh, items around. Guess which uh, class of things uh, got a priority in early uh, to, you know, 2020? It wasn't libraries. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, we did have, alert, yeah. <laughs> we did have a question about, um, 
how what do you know what percentage of libraries in Indiana are are part of Evergreen Indiana? I didn't do the math, so I just uh, direct messages. It's 132 public libraries out of 237 public libraries. Okay, those are yeah, systems. So. so 132 systems out of 100, and uh, but two of them are not live yet. We're working on that. All three of them are next, not live. Yeah, one next week, right? Working on that. Yeah, yeah, I'm counting them as live, but they're not. Yeah, and we are in Pennsylvania. Um, because it is the land of exemptions, we we are our own nonprofit, and then the statewide courier, uh, the statewide organization that manages the UPS shipping consortium is a separate nonprofit. So the nice thing is we do have to do grant. It's fundamentally federal money that we're supported by, so we do have to do some grant related procurement stuff. But we don't go through state procurement and state contracting. So costs costs and benefits. Um, one of the things, uh, and I'll, I'll tee Galen up for his introduction to the next slide, is that because we have libraries that are using multiple methods to move things depending on where they're going, um, those, those methods may have dramatically different costs. And so thinking about how us trying to understand what those what the delivery schedules are what the shipping schedules are where does the van driver sort on the road or do things all go to a hub and get resorted and go back out the next week uh so we've we've taken a deep dive into to some of that logistical information So uh, thank you for that uh, tee up, um, uh, Katie. So um, I'm uh, starting this uh, you know, section with a controversial um, statement. You cannot, in fact, uh, get everything uh, you want, um, just hopefully uh, enough. Um, so the reason I bring it up this way is in terms of managing resource sharing and transits, there are a set of outcomes that um, you can choose to optimize for and that will have um, inevitable trade-offs. So time meant to fulfillment. Well, you know, it's nice to, to get the books that the patrons want in their hands uh, as uh, quickly as uh, possible. Um, but, um, you know, one way uh, to do that, of course, uh, would be you know, FedEx, next day air service, um, and then you end up at the end of the year with uh, no money. Um, you know, so it, that can be balanced off uh, with uh, the trade-off on minimizing transit uh, costs. Um, and of course, depending on exactly how and when uh, your materials are moving around, um, the costs uh, differ uh, significantly, both on year, and time of year. Um, so for example, uh, I know in Pennsylvania, it can matter whether school is in session or not uh, for some of uh, the transit uh, routes because um, you know some of uh, the so-called intermediate units uh, in Pennsylvania provide shipping services uh, for the libraries, but not year round. Um, another um, thing that you might want to op optimize is pr simply predictability. Um, you may be okay with us saying it takes four days uh, for something to move uh, across uh, the state, so long as it's utter, uh, utterly predictable um, what, you know, what that transit time uh, will be. Uh, another aspect is fairness. And there's a kind of uh, worms. Um, so what might be fairness for the patron? Um, it might be by gum, if I'm number 27 out of 500 uh, in the hold uh, queue, I'd better be the 27th person uh, to get the other hands uh, on uh, the book versus, you know, perhaps a broader sense of uh, fairness of, you know, getting things uh, to the patrons as quickly as possible, you know, the getting stuff to the mostest, uh, the soonest uh, to utterly abuse the ang English uh, language. But to maximize that, you 
you often don't actually want literally um, first in, first out, hold the fulfillment um, in a consortium. Another aspect of fair fairness is balance of uh, trade, uh, as per. Um, you know, and that you know uh, ties into you know does a library feel like they're getting enough stuff from other libraries for their patrons to balance out what they're sending out uh, to other libraries their patrons, and of course that is sometimes very much the reason for very difficult uh, discussions uh, in a consortium. Um, and then the other pair of outcomes you know that you could consider maximizing is what I'm calling legibility. Um, does it make sense to library staff why a given item is being shipped uh, to another library? Um, and can you explain it to patrons? And does it make uh, sense uh, you know to the patrons? And that's arguably not a completely solved uh, problem in uh, in Evergreen yet, um, particularly for anybody doing um, resource sharing um, to give patrons the most accurate sense of when they can expect uh, their stuff um, without giving the implication that um, there is, um, you know, Star Trek style teleporters uh, involved. And of course, that's, one of the reasons why Evergreen, I think pretty much uniquely among iOSs, has uh, so many knobs uh, to twist and turn, and we'll actually go into that a little later. Um, and in case you're wondering why is there a hippo uh, on the slide, if you want to learn more about how Evergreen uh, can do it, um, there are presentations uh, from past Evergreen conferences uh, about hippos and space hippos that will give you a deep dive. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to my fellow panelists to talk about, in the case of your consortia, what aspects are you trying to optimize and which do you care a bit less about? And let's begin with uh, Joe. Okay. I would say that we probably, um... On the, on the whole, try to minimize transit costs as one of our goals, which is part of why the consortium is using a statewide um, 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 bid contract that is used by multiple consortia, minimizing the cost of it. It also does, to a lesser extent, maximize some level of predictability. I can tell you at which library, at most libraries, there's a three day a week have three day a week stops, for instance, with transits. Um, on fairness, I think we do work towards the sanctity of the holds queue, if for no other reason than because there are too many frontline staff who have full visibility of the holds queue and are in small enough libraries that they notice if one of their patrons gets skipped. So um, I think we contemplated sort of a geographic getting stuff in the most hands the soonest, and it was just not workable with how much visibility holds have for the frontline staff. Um, and that's that's probably everything. Who'd like to go next? This isn't going to surprise everyone. We let each system choose. <laughs> So we have. I just unmic so I could laugh out loud. <laughs> we have uh, system. We have systems that absolutely the the holds queue is the most important. You know they have central purchasing and central holds queues, and that that's what they want. Um, and you know this the beginning of of this presentation and also our involvement in the in the work that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> it's the wild wild west, except. In Pennsylvania. Um, so Galen uh, was uh, hanging out with me at the Pennsylvania Library Association conference and talking about some of the work that he'd done with um, Missouri Evergreen to look at optimizing for for transit time. Uh, and so we were talking about doing this, and so we you know we we started working on it. And then I think about two months in, I said, okay, 
um, you know, our, our people are getting these major shipping cost estimates. So we now have to pivot and say, manually identify, these are the library combinations where things get shipped. Those all need to have lower priority. Those, those are more expensive transits and so should be deprioritized and cheaper transits should be prioritized even if the time to fill is longer. Uh, so I, I think we get a, a peek at some of the intense uh, spreadsheeting that that happened after that. Um, but that 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 lack of consistency in our consortium, which has good good and bad things, um, combined with the external factors impacting our libraries, um, has has led to a very complicated answer to that question of what we're maximizing for. So for Evergreen Indiana, um, there are several things that came to mind here. Uh, the first thing that I actually was thinking about has to do with the hold queue. And you might have seen a comment there from Jason Boyer about the, the hold queue in there as well. Um, also with Indiana Provenance. Um, so, and I see this as a training um, issue in Evergreen, Indiana, and we do talk about it that, of course, there is a holds queue and it does have meaning, but it is it does not have sanctity um, because of all of the optimizations that are available in Evergreen. Um, and we want we go more towards the getting stuff to the most to the soonest. Um, that also means that uh, we have seen a shift again, similar to uh, the Ohio libraries away from age protection um, or to a shorter age protection. Now, the other thing that, um, that I have been prioritizing as somebody that you know, just went through a thing with our uh, transit program, our, our courier system is a better way to say that is being able to um, use some of the knobs and levers in Evergreen to turn on and off resource sharing um, in different locations, depending on what is happening. And this is in the event of a catastrophe. And I know that's, it's a, like that's maybe a little extreme use of the word catastrophe, these are libraries. But at the same time, a library catastrophe. What happens when there's nobody to drive these things around? Um, well, then you don't want people putting holds on things like that are in places where they can't get them from. And so um, looking at ways to do that, I had a conversation earlier, I'm not gonna describe um, the quick, and dirty way that, and that is how it's referred to, quick and dirty way to be able to do that without um, getting org units involved and all of that. Uh, but that is also uh, one of my priorities is to be able to be responsive to the situation that's going on with our courier system. Uh, also, when we were talking about this, um, we we're talk talking about my reaction to the word fairness. Uh, I am a fairly traumatized Gen Xer. And uh, so the idea of fairness is the world is unfair, um, which is not the best way to lead when you're talking to literally anybody in the entire world. Uh, but there is definitely so much balance that has to happen there. Um, also for me, and this again goes back to the um, training aspect to this maximizing legibility to library staff. And I think about that in my head, um, transparency in what the system is actually doing. That does not mean a full explanation. Good luck with that. Um, you can do it, but you're gonna get some glazed eyes, but at least having an understanding as we're communicating to library staff that it is complicated and this is why these have been our priorities so that they can also manage expectations when they're talking to patrons. So that also being an aspect of maximizing legibility. Um, 
cost, I have not spent a whole lot of time on that because in this, this is a flippant way to say it, that's somebody else's department. Um, and if I had more time, I will be leaving Evergreen Indiana, I would deep dive into that really hardcore because that is, first of all, money is important or not important, hearkening back to Richard saying the problem is capitalism, but whatever. I'm not going to go there right now, uh, but um, it is a great thing to be able to stand up in front of any body of professionals um, in in what we do, whether it be legislators or it be librarians or, ho or whoever, um, and say we have the least expensive mode for moving things around between libraries and we have the highest volume of things moving around. Of course, there is a correlation there. So um, this slide here, the outcomes to trade off, I, I would just think of um, a teeter totter or a scale or something like that always. You're always looking, how do you get it into the middle so that somebody's not like, you know, breaking their tailbone on the ground or flipping through the air or whatever, um, that that is part of the, the privilege, I guess that we get to do and the challenge to be able to find that balance. So, um, you know, obviously, if you want to optimize uh, something, you know, regardless of uh, which axis uh, or axes uh, you're most uh, concerned about on uh, the teeter-totter, um, you know, there's of course uh, the question of how can you measure uh, results um, and in a way beyond, uh, is this a particular super patron, you know, uh, either very happy at library uh, board meetings uh, or uh, complaining. So, You know, some possible metrics, uh, of course, are time-based. Um, how long does it take for something to be in transit or to be fulfilled uh, in the patron's hand? Um, but of course, the variation matters uh, because if on average, um, it takes three days to cross the state, but every now and again, it takes two weeks, that variation, that variance could almost be worse uh, than the transit at time, uh, particularly if you don't know why. Um, you know, you can try to measure how much time the item is uselessly sitting on the courier van or on uh, the hold shelf, um, because um, well, I'm sure that every now and again, a van di uh, you know, driver who gets uh, stuck in traffic <laughs> might open up uh, a tote uh, and uh, start reading. Generally, if it's in the van, it's not being read. There's, of course, also um, a question about pointless uh, transits. Um, now, happily, um, that doesn't seem to be a problem, at least uh, for Spark, as much as uh, you might think it could be. Um, but it can be a um, real problem if you have a book bouncing between libraries A and B um, because you know somebody changed uh, their mind um, or uh, because uh, there was uh, some flaw in the targeting. Um, you know there can be concerns about measures of that balance. Obviously, cost uh, is a factor, and cost, uh, by the way also very much depends on how the transits are being paid for in the first place. Um, if you're paying per tote, um, you know, your view of cost uh, control could be very different uh, than if uh, what you're doing is paying for number of days a week uh, that the uh, courier service uh, stops uh, by. Um, but yeah, we also do have to acknowledge um, the super patron, but also patrons in general, and that's getting a you know sense of um, are they satisfied with the resource sharing, um, and keep it in mind that sometimes um, they will not tell you. 
um, if they're uh, dissatisfied and we'll just simply look for all options other than uh, your library. And then of course, you know, there's also the question of staff satisfaction. You know, is the system understandable? Um, does it give them predictable work um, so that uh, they're not doing things like packing up uh, 10 books uh, for transit uh, today and 500 uh, the next uh, day? Um, so those are all things that you can measure. Um, good chunk of them can be done through evergreen uh, reports uh, or doing a deep dive in the database. Others might uh, depend on the courier service, which is why on the one slide there was just one wish list item uh, about um, getting API access to track our shipments. And so, um, you know, with the data, you know, you can do visualizations. So in this case, uh, this is uh, coming now uh, from Spark. Um, this will probably do better if you look at the slides after the, the fact, um, but it's basically a time frame of average transit time and standard deviation of that transit time uh, for Spark as a whole. And you know you can see some of the obvious uh, events like um, in 2020, the world uh, changed. Um, and you know one consequence uh, was that um, there was a big spike in transit uh, during the early lockdown uh, period uh, in um, you know, uh, in the, the pandemic. Well, and you can see, if you see the one, the 2014, 2015 run one, we migrated from one evergreen hosting provider to another. And so you could actually see that slight delay in, in stuff getting moved around um, for that, for that transition, which I thought was cool. Indeed. So, um, being sensitive uh, to time, um, I'd like to suggest to the panel that we go ahead and move on to some of, uh, you know, but I think it might be uh, the, well, all right, so we do have to talk about knobs uh, first, and then uh, we can get to uh, the pretty fun uh, part of this. <laughs> so um, some things uh, inside Evergreen, age of production. Um, I will mention, by the way, Ruth, um, that your use of age of production to lock down transit so temporarily is a new one. I didn't uh, say didn't... that loud. I, I think it was panels. <laughs> I think we were the ones who did it. Oh, okay. Yeah, pardon me. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah, very good use of it. Um, yeah, yeah and that, that's, that's my quick and dirty thing that I didn't say out loud because I didn't want anybody to go off willy-nilly without talking about it first. Right. <laughs> um, but also proximity adjustments, um, very important uh, for um, Spark uh, and Missouri Evergreen, um, and the best hold uh, selection sort order. Um, I will also give a shout out to the upcoming presentation during the next uh, slot, uh, where Liu Ao and Marshall of NC Cardinal will be talking about um, how they're uh, adjusting for geography. Um, but there's also some interesting things you can do outside of Evergreen, and that's where I'd like to turn it over to uh, the rest of the panel for any uh, comments. So this is something that we have been talking a lot with libraries about, not for resource sharing within Evergreen as much as their use of statewide IOL systems because of the dramatic increase in shipping costs that they've seen over the last few years. Um, you know, I, I know I worked in a library where there was no communication between the ILL staff and the purchasing staff. Um, and so to, to have that, to, to just think about, you know, if a, if a materials request comes in, can you evaluate it as a materials request and then decide if you're going to fill it with a purchase, you're going to fill it with a hold, or you're going to fill it with an underlibrary loan request? Um, you know, that that's what we're recommending as a best practice is to to evaluate to if you if staff have to touch each request for something that, you know, the patron hasn't found it in the ILS, even if it may be there, um, you know, then then evaluate it before you decide how to fill it. 
Um, so that's that's one of the things that we've been really working with with our libraries to think about th their workflows in that way. Uh, and and then to to back that up with the software of saying, okay, well, if it is, you know, like if you have 10 libraries you can get things from, let's try to pull it from the one that's going to be the closest or the cheapest um, and have have the hold policies then follow from the desires of the library. And talking on about some of these outside of Evergreen things in cool in Ohio, we're small enough that we have definitely on more than one occasion said, okay, we can't do this via third party. We'll make the software work and we will just do it ourselves. I will bring you the book. You'll stop by and get the book, et cetera, et cetera. Though right now, even though we are small, we are also looking at collection development agreements as ways to try to say solve certain perennial problems like that the demand for holiday books more than exceeds our supply across the libraries and just sort of working together to fix that as opposed to each sort of going their own way because we I was going to say that we have a lot of autonomy in deciding what we do but I but then Katie started talking about Pennsylvania and I realized we kind of demand a lot of our of our um, members <laughs> I have lots of anecdotes. We about demand holidays, a ton, but but we don't have time for my anecdotes about, <laughs> about mm -hmm. holiday books. I thought we were really flexible, uh, but compared to most library library construction, we're not at all. Uh, one of the things that we do, and and more, this is I'm going to focus, of course, more outside of Evergreen in this, and I hadn't even thought about this until Joe, you brought up and then of course the collection development agreement. So one thing that Evergreen Indiana has chosen to do, um, and that was through the, the committees that the choose the things to do, um, is that we have a high holds fulfillment collection. Um, so we get reports on um, what are the things that are being most requested throughout the consortium. And if it reaches a certain ratio um, and it kind of, that's a flexible ratio of holds per copies. Uh, the consortium purchases things to fill those and then we just send them out. There are no age protection or anything like that. So we do did at one point have 16 copies of Spare um, for Prince Harry and um, every single Colleen Hoover thing that ever came across Book Talk ever. Um, and they're still circulating by the way. Um, so we did, that is one of the things that we did. Um, I kind of am in this weird position where I have lots of thoughts about this and I would love to do like some, I, I, I love big projects and I don't know, that might be a personality disorder or something, I'm not sure. But nonetheless, like it, like if there's something that can be like built out to like really do something amazing, I'm, I'm here for it. And I think that there is room in Indiana to really look at um, what we have been taking for granted and how we can work collaboratively. I feel like I hate to use that, but it is what we're doing. Work collaboratively with our member libraries and other organizations that we kind of touch a little bit more tangentially um, to really optimize how we are dealing with resource sharing instead of just taking for granted that it works because we've just recently been in a situation where it didn't. Um, and so, and so I'm going to transition. Yes. I want to, I want to. Yeah, so let's go on to the next thing. <laughs> well, actually, we are out of time if we're going to give oh. a break. Yeah. Uh, because the next session starts at one o'clock. So Fair. if it is okay with you, Carol, we will uh, just continue on for a couple minutes here and then transition over to the, the next presenters in this track. But if you do need a glass of water or a minute before the next presentation, please take care of yourself. Stay Go get it. Do that now. <laughs> okay. We got some strange things. Let's see them.
All right, going quickly, we um, talking about using people, we decided when the transit systems were down in 2020, because we were ready to share and nobody else was, so to speak, uh, we did it ourselves and drove to a central location. And in 2022, when the system was breaking down because of a variety of things to do with hiring drivers in the pandemic, we also drove all of our things to a centrally defined location sort of one person from each cluster. And the slide in a lot of ways says it all. Um, and I can hand off now since we are so short on time. And those are, for those of you who do not have familiarity yeah. with Ohio, those are distances. Like that's like what, three, two, three hours in between it's, those. It, it's not so bad. We. One of us had the sense to come up with a central location so nobody was driving more than about 90 minutes okay. there. Okay. Um, and we're the yeah. Midwest, so one, one we, just, we just drive. <laughs> it's I mean, it's just, it was it's the fun. first time it was 2020. What else were we going to do, you know? <laughs> and it was only like four staff out of a dozen-ish libraries. So it was manageable-ish. <laughs> All right, maybe the rest of it should wait for the social time to give people a chance to rush to the washroom or something and, and make the transition to the next uh, host and such. I'm sorry to cut you off. We'd be happy to no? let you oh, it's cool. talk. Thank talk you so much for moderating. <laughs> yeah, because we would have gone on for hours. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I was yeah. I was the assigned timekeeper, and I did not hold up my end of the bargain. Oh, Galen, can we see the kitties for ten and the seconds? The slides will be available. Yes, the slides, the slides will, be will be available. There is a recording, and uh, kitties. <laughs> yes, and kitties. so I'd like to thank all of our speakers for a great session, and thanks to everyone for attending. 